Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today we're going to be getting back to the sciences. I did this last year. I think maybe I'll just do it every year sort of thing. This is going to be the 10 biggest medical innovations for 2021. Now the article is from Health Tech. It's actually the 10 biggest medical innovations for 2021, according to the Cleveland Clinic. The title of the headline is World Leading Clinicians and Researchers Unveil Groundbreaking Medical Advances and Introduce a New Prize for Innovation in Healthcare. Now, as I do with most of these, I haven't done them in a while. I will put the link in the descriptions. If I forget, let me know. This way you can go through and read it. This is where we highlight how bad I am at the English language and how I murder words, especially in the sciences, because it gets real funny. In any case, I usually read it through. I might stop here and there and I'll, um, you know, give a peace of mind or a thought that might be going through my head. But for the most part, I'll read it. I'll give credit to the person who wrote the article. And I guess we'll start. This is by... Well, it's only given credit to Health Tech EU. Let me see if there's a person at the bottom, like a name, because I don't like. Uh, I don't see a name here. So maybe they have a team that just posts the article. All right, I guess credit goes to Health Tech EU or something like that. All right, I'll begin. The annual Medical Innovation Summit organized by Cleveland Clinic Innovations, the Department and Commercialization Division of Cleveland Clinic, is now in its 18th year and has served as a key platform for the introduction of the 10 biggest medical innovations for 2021. From gene therapy for blood diseases to increase access to telemedicine to a new class of cystic fibrosis drugs. The list of cutting-edge technologies was selected and presented by a Cleveland Clinic expert panel led by Dr. Will Morris, Executive Medical Director of Cleveland Clinic Innovations, and Dr. Akhil Saklacha, Managing Director of Cleveland Clinic Ventures. And then we'll just go through the 10 innovations that they list. The first one, number one, gene therapy for hemoglobinopathies. <laughs> Hemoglobio, hamo, hemio, ham, hemoglobinopathies. Okay, got it? So we all know what word we're talking about now, right? What are hemoglobinopathies? <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, again, hemoglobinopathies. Hemoglobinopathies are genetic disorders that affect the structure or production of the hemoglobin molecule, the red protein responsible for transporting oxygen in the blood. The most common he hemoglobinopathies include sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Together, these disorders affect more than 330,000 children born each year worldwide. Sickle cell disease affects more than 100,000 patients in the United States alone. An experimental gene therapy has been developed as a result of the latest research into <laughs> hemoglobinopathies, this therapy should enable affected people to create functional hemoglobin molecules. Hemoglo oh, so if it's hemo, hemoglobinopathies. This therapy should enable affected people to create functional hemoglobin molecules that will reduce the presence of sickle, sickle blood cells or red blood cells that are ineffective in cases of thalassemia. In this way, it will be possible to prevent the complications associated with these disorders. 
Now, I knew somebody, um, I guess, you know, 50, going to be 51. I've, this is common enough that you know it's for people you know. And we'll see how this works out. I'm ho hopeful for it. But if it helps people, that's going to be great. Um, wow, that was a tough first opening, huh? All right, we'll see how far we get. Two. New drug for primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis, MS, is an autoimmune disease in which the immune system attacks the protective fatty myelin sheath that covers nerve fibers. This attack leads to communication problems between the brain and the rest of the body, often resulting in permanent damage, deterioration, and ultimately death. About 15% of the people with MS develop a primary progressive form of the disease. This subset of the disease is characterized by a progressive development and a steady progression of signs and symptoms. A new therapeutic monoclonal antibody approved by the FDA with a novel target is in the first and only treatment, oh, is the first and only treatment for MS in the primary progressive MS population. Now, this is big. Um, sometimes you'll see a recap. Maybe I'll try to do that during the year as I look and try to pinpoint something that is targeting this. But I think this is a great thing. You know, how destructive MS can be to people, especially to people who get, um, you know, this major problem or 15% of the people with MS develop it. Anything that'll help that shows a little bit of hope. That's why I guess I like to do these things. All right. So what do we got next? Ooh, smart pacemakers. Used to prevent or correct arrhythmias, pacemakers and defibrillators deliver electrical impulses to the chambers of the heart muscle to contract and pump blood to the body. Traditionally, these implanted devices allow remote monitoring through a console at bedside that transmit data to the doctor in charge of care. Although millions of patients use these devices, many still lack a basic understanding of how they work. Connecting these devices to an application available on patient smartphones will allow them to gain a better understanding of their cardiac treatment while transmitting valuable data to their doctors. Now, this is big all around, because what, what they're calling telemedicine is becoming huge, especially with the pandemic and things like that. The way you can contact online doctors and get somewhat information. Now, with technology, you're giving medical, real medical uh, information coming from your body, and in this case, a pacemaker, which I think is incredible. I mean, like it's like, you're living almost in a space age type thing when you look at the little things that could be amplified. I mean, you could say, oh, you could wake up one day in a, on your bed and not feel good, hit a button, and all your necessary information is transmitted to your doctor. I mean, you could see these things happening, which is why I think they're incredible, which is why I even like doing these type of um, podcasts where I just read these things about innovations. There are technolog technological ones that are isolated too, but this is more of a medical thing. But this is great. Smart pacemakers. I mean, way to go. Number four. New drugs for cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, a hereditary disease that affects more than 30,000 people in the United States, is characterized by a thick, sticky mucus that obstructs their airways and traps germs leading to infections, inflammation, inflammation, and other med health complications. Caused by a defective hmm, transmembrane conductance regulatory protein, <laughs> CFTR, people affected by this disease must try to stay away from others to limit their exposure to potentially fatal germs. Until last year, the drug available for the disease, the drugs available for the disease were only effective 
in people affected by certain mutations. A new combination of drugs approved by the FDA in October of 2018 has proven to be effective in people with F508DEL. Did I miss something? No. The most common mutation in the CF gene. All right, so that's the most common mutation. It's F508, DEL, or DEL, <laughs> which accounts for approximately 90% of the people with the disease. Now, you hear about this, again, this is something else. This is not, um, you know, I think a lot of the innovations, and maybe they'll just hint that they're a ward at the end, um, <clears throat> is going to be for things that we commonly have in our lives that make a big impact on a lot of people. So, Let's hope that it keeps uh, showing promise, but if it gives hope for people, you know, you know a lot of people talk about cystic fibrosis if they're not talking about it for themselves or someone they know. All right, we're at number five. Universal treatment of hepatitis C. All right, hepatitis C, described by the CDC as a silent epidemic, is one of the biggest public health concerns in the United States. People infected with the virus face serious risks, including cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver cancer, all of which can be life-threatening. There are drugs available to treat the condition, but so far they have proven ineffective on some genotypes of the disease or come with an undesirable side effect. A new FDA-approved treatment option, a fixed-dose combination of drugs, has been shown to be more than 90% effective in treating hepatitis C genotypes 1 to 6, which means that this new treatment is an effective option for a large number of patients. So again, something you hear about all the time. You know, I don't know, hepatitis C, but I would say um, Pamela Anderson's like the... Uh, Oh, like the biggest thing I can remember in the news. But again, something that is widespread and as the CDC describe it as a silent epidemic. Anything you can get to help is going to be awesome. And with 90% effective in treating it, well, the genotypes, whatever one to six is, a large number of the patients will have an effective option. And when you go to the doctor, you want to get treated, you want to hear good news. If it's not always good news, at least it's options. You know, we want options. You know, you could try this or you could try that. So, kudos. We'll see what happens with that in the future. Six. Non-invasive CPAP for improved lung function in premature babies. Premature babies are often exposed to a range of risks, particularly respiratory risks. Premature babies suffering from infantile respiratory distress syndrome, IRDS, are most often administered a surfactant during mechanical ventilation. <laughs> this practice has the potential to cause long-term lung damage and is a major contributor to the development of chronic lung disease, BCPAP. A new method of non-invasive ventilation has been developed to deliver continuous positive airway pressure to newborns to maintain lung volume during exhalation. Rather than applying constant pressure to the infant, BCPAP applies oscillating pressure that reduces physical trauma while stimulating lung growth when administered over a long period of time, ensuring a safe and effective treatment of respiratory syndromes in infants. That's great. I can just imagine all the parents out there and newborns coming. There's always that anxiety or a level of stress. And uh, some people have these issues just sleeping, just having to watch their babies all night. You hear everything. No, this is good. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the point of medicine is to treat them but do no harm, right? So, you know you're doing this treatment, you need to use it, it's going to damage their lungs. But you want to, you know, give them the best shot at life and a healthy life. But you're pl 
playing a balance game here. This seems like you got something they're developing that will not be um, traumatizing to the infant and damage their lungs. That's going to be something amazing. I mean, I haven't had any children, but that gives you good, you know, good thoughts of where that, you know, development will go. We'll go to number seven. The rise of telemedicine through new practices and policy changes. Wow, I kind of talked about that in the other one. One of the challenges brought by the pandemic has been the need to transform medical visits to ensure the safety of patients and doctors. This has been addressed by the increasing use of telemedicine. Virtual care is gradually becoming common practice following a change in policy at government and provider level to ensure increased consumer uptake. Recognizing the importance of these new tools, state and federal regulators have moved quickly to remove regulatory barriers to telemedicine. These measures have enabled a new practice to develop, a new practice to develop new programs as well as expand existing networks. Now you see, this is one of those great things that you always, well for me, is that voice in the back of my head, which this will be abused, right? I mean, look at the slew of things that tarnished psychology, you know, the pseudo science bullshit, and, you know, uh, there are good things that come out and there's information to be gleaned, but it gets abused by, you know, opportunists or whatever. You want to wonder what the fuck people want to start screaming capitalism, but you have here. Our technology merging, like I said before, I could envision just a smart bed. I mean, you wake up in the night, you hit a button, and it tells you, oh, you know, your heart rate was this at night, go to the doctor, or you don't feel good and you send your information virtually, uh, electronically. A scanner's in your house, a scanner's at the corner, grocery store, where you can just go in. I mean, yeah, we're going to scream, you know, the government watching us, but I mean, come on. This is what technology is going to do. So, this one was just a general telemedicine with new practices and policy changes, which is good. I think it's good. I mean, it's going to lead to people abusing things, but this is the human nature, right? The human condition. Eight, novel device for postpartum hemorrhage. Postpartum hemorrhage affects 1% to 5% of women giving birth characterized by excessive bleeding after birth of the child. The complication may require blood transfusions, administration of drugs with dangerous side effects, lengthy and uncomfortable procedures, and may lead, may even lead to an emergency hysterectomy resulting in loss of fertility. Until now, non-surgical interventions targeting the site of bleeding have been limited to balloon devices that dilate the uterus while compressing the bleeding site. The new approach to postpartum hemorrhage is vacuum-induced uterine tamponade, or tamponade, tamponade, I guess, tampon, tamponade. This method uses the negative pressure created inside the uterus to collapse the bleeding cavity, causing the muscle to close the vessels. This low-tech innovation could save the lives of women all over the world, especially in developing countries where Access to resources is often limited. Now, something like this, believe it or not, gives me goosebumps. You know, a low-tech way, a new way of thinking about doing things that can greatly help people. And this is common. This is, you hear this all the time. Again, it's part of our lives, which is why I like some of these innovation things that they impact us. They could resonate with us that, you know, Mary next door or, you know, your aunt, uncle, and the new generation of people will get more options. But this is incredible to me. i got to read that again. The, uh, the new approach to postpartum hemorrhage is vacuum-induced uterine tamponade. This method uses the negative pressure created inside the uterus to collapse the bleeding cavity, causing the muscle to close the vessels. This low-tech innovation could save the lives of women Wow, I mean, I don't know.
Now you always get, you know, hope, you know, rises up in me. All right, so this will be number, that was number eight. This is number nine. PR, PARP inhibitors for prostate cancer. Over the past decade, progress has been made in the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer, with one in nine men diagnosed with the disease during his lifetime. It remains the second leading cause of cancer death among men in the United States. Pharmaceutical inhibitors, known for their success in women's cancer, block proteins called PARPs that help repair damaged tumor DNA in people with mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Two of them have been shown to delay the progression of prostate cancer in men with refractory cancer and mutations in the DNA repair pathway. In May 2020, both were approved for treatment of the disease. All right, well, there's one up my alley, right? You know, we always say at a certain age, you always keep getting checked. Um, second leading cause of cancer among men. Do it. Go for it. Let's 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 figure this stuff out. I mean, we have a certain time not too long ago we were able to figure out the human genome and we have the computers to map it all, which would have, ta- would have taken up. I mean, we are progressing and it's gotta progress in this area of cancer and uh something that was being used to help women isn't being helped men. This is great. I think there's a um a future where we you know, is, is it a balance between, you know, we're going to genetically alter before they come out of the womb? Uh, it may, maybe that'll happen first. Like, I don't think there'll be a, oh, let's go to the local medical place and get a shot and you're going to be cancer-free for the rest of your life. I can see in vitro, is that what they call it? Or before, while the baby's, you know, before it's born... They will make alterations to say, you know, this kid won't, you want to get cancer, or he'll live to 150. And I guess that's genetics, but, or, you know, um, Star Trek, <laughs> that's where Khan came. Um, yeah, so, PARP inhibitors for prostate cancer. All right, we got that. Now, we're getting to the last one. Now, these aren't, like, ranked, but, um, number 10, new medicines specifically targeting migraines usually treated with multi-purpose medications such as high blood pressure medication antidepressants anti-convulsion drugs and botox injections migraine attacks affect more than 38 million people in the united states or 12 percent of the population these methods while effective in some cases do not provide a concrete solution to help relieve migraine pain. In 2018, new drugs have been developed specifically targeting this condition. By blocking the activity of a molecule called calcitonin, a calcitonin gene related peptide, <laughs> you know, I could have gotten this word if I didn't doubt myself. A molecule called calcitonin gene related peptide. CGRP, which reaches its peak during a migraine. This class of drugs is now approved by the FDA. Currently actively prescribed, this new class of drugs represents a major breakthrough in the treatment of migraines. So there you go. Uh, You know, 38 million people in the United States, 12% of the population. And, you know, where, where have we gotten? I got, uh, I don't know, Tylenol and Bayer. There is that thing I always try to read up on where there's aspirin is better for something and acetaminophen, whatever the fuck they call these things, are better for another. So I'm not sure how that works. Hmm. But in any case, we have hit number 10 and we are targeting migraines. What more do you need? So that'll be the 10. Now it does say at next year's Medical Innovation Summit, Cleveland Clinic will also introduce a new award in honor of its rich history 
of innovation and progress in healthcare provision. I didn't go on to explain it'll be published in 2021. See, in my eyes, these lab guys, these doctors, and they should be as famous as baseball players, as football players. I mean, I sometimes just wonder what a science, science literate country would look like. I mean, what, I don't think we are. And I don't mean you didn't go to school and learn about, because I love science in school. I was fascinated by it. But let's say some people, it was like math, because I hated math. And Look, I know too many people, we see it all over. This is not just um, information that is just, you know, common to me, but we can all look at it, you know, and see the problem we have in this country with science and fucking people and vaccines and all this shit, but we've had a crazy year, two years now, and this is the top 10 medical innovations for 2021, and if you notice, a couple of them were something that mentioned something about another year. Now, I haven't done this long enough, but let's say I was doing it for five years. We might have had the 2018 breakthrough podcast or article that talked about something, but now in 2021... It is coming to fruition. And that can give you an idea of how long things can take. You might hear about something new. And of course, we can go to the traditional military first. You know, and how the system is set up. We'll see. I had a conversation of uh, our military with a friend from overseas. And we were discussing it. I'm like, no, I think the Google Glasses tech, all that VR stuff. Is being perfected for the military first. Right? You know, like that thing about how you get your refrigerator and your microwaves. And so, look, I'm not one for the military industrial complex or in any case. And I, like I said, I, even, I don't even hold a label of Democrat or Republican. I probably don't know what the fuck I am. Maybe green these days. I don't know. But we have innovations. This is to me hopeful. Sometimes the hope pans out where, like, you see something from 2008 and it's been given to go and it's working. It's helping 90% of the people. I'm all for it. I'm all for being science literate, learning about things. And when I first started doing these, I would talk a lot about um, the methods you use in finding out information. So even if it's about the pandemic or it's about a fucking movie star or a rumor There are ways you can go about looking for information that you could validate to some extent. And too many people these days just click, copy, you know, share, which is fine. I don't have that type of mindset that it's all bad or mostly bad. I think it's great. I think it's wonderful. This is new age. We're all walking around with Star Trek devices in our pockets. And for me, the nerd in me, I love it. So I love doing science, a little bit of medical in, in there. Give me a little bit of hope that we still move forward. We still hope for the best, plan for the worst, and help each other out. So I hope everybody's doing well. I hope these times are doing good. I mean, we're in New York. We've got so much snow, and it's sticking around. It rained. got a little better. Really cold. And I just think of homeless people and, you know, when can we get our shit together? So some of these things help. Be good, everybody. Till next time, take care.